Welcome to our class of 8.5. Uh, we're still had a few minutes. Uh, I need to cover some things for this class uh, because I think it's very important. And I'm sorry I ran out of time. So I hope you give me just a few extra minutes to talk about this because it's very, uh, this is a great, uh, important part of hermeneutics, helpful questions to ask when establishing context. So first question would be, who is speaking? Uh, that's very, very important. You know, I think about how Job's wife said, curse God and die to Job, or mainly what we read about in the book of Job, you read about Job's three friends. You got to remember that those men are not inspired, but inspiration records their conversations, just like inspiration records Satan, what he said. But you remember that Satan, he told lies, didn't he? Uh, Genesis 3 and so forth. Uh, let me give you a good example of this, um, of what happened to me once when I lived in Korea. Um, let me go to the Bible here, because it's very important to show you what I mean. So in John 16, uh, 12 and 13, let's go there. Uh, so it says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. So I was in a Bible class, and I was teaching on this. I don't remember exactly, specifically what the conversation was or the context of it was. But uh, I was saying that, you know, this was who was speaking. It was definitely Jesus to his apostles. I mean, that's the context. When you read John 13 through 16, it is definitely the 12 apostles, okay, or who would become known as the apostles. And uh, I remember this lady, she said, no, no, that that, that applies to me. Well, he's going to, the Spirit's going to guide you in all truth. Friend, you see, you got to take this into context. Now, is it true that the Bible is our guide? Yes, no doubt about that. Is it true the Holy Spirit guides us through his word? It, yes, but not in a direct manner. You know, he's not going to directly guide us under inspiration. Okay, that's something we need to recognize. And uh, I tried to explain, you know, the original context of this, that the Holy Spirit's going to be with them and reveal things to them because Jesus didn't tell everything while he was in his earthly ministry. And the Holy Spirit was going to directly help them, the apostles, to remember everything and to guide them into all truth and to set up the new covenant system, basically, and to confirm it by miracles. So that's that's something that we need to remember. Who's speaking, right? All right, our next thing is... Okay, number two, who's being addressed? Uh, so let's look at Genesis 6, 14. And Acts 1, 1 through 5. <clears throat> okay, so Genesis 6, 14 says... Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover inside and outside with pitch. Uh, of course, who is being spoken to? Well, God is speaking to Noah, right? Now, you know, I know this sounds like a cheesy example, but honestly, is that command for me and you today? Am I supposed to go out and make an ark? Well, no, of course not. We recognize that there are specific directions, specific commandments that were given to certain uh, people. I think about Adam and Eve that G God talked to, right? He told them, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Well, you know, that commandment's not going to apply to us today, obviously, because, uh, one, the garden's been destroyed. Uh, two, uh, we see as a case, um, you know, some other things that we read about um, that it was... Uh, Talking to Abraham, for example, go to Mount Moriah and offer your son Isaac, right? We understand, but we recognize that there are principles, you know, 
that we live by. And faith is a principle. Obedience is a principle. Love is a principle. Uh, grace is a principle. So there are certain things we learn from the Old Testament. And so we got to recognize who's speaking and who's being spoken to. It's very important when establishing context. All right. And then uh, I thought Acts 1, 1 through 5 is a very good example of this too, right? Um, you know, a lot of people misunderstand the uh, baptism in the Holy Spirit. But when you read this carefully, you can see who's who it's talking to, right? So the former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to who? To the apostles, whom he had chosen. To whom? The apostles. He also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by who? Them. The apostles during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God and being assembled together with them. He commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the father, which he said, you have heard from me for John truly baptized with water. But ah, you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Not many days from now. Who's being spoken to the apostles. It's very important that we recognize this principle, friends. It would clear up a lot of confusion. All right, our next uh, helpful question, or sorry, well, let's let's talk about this. This is very important when it's who's being spoken to. So um, when we talk about the this baptism of the Holy Spirit, some use this passage to teach the need for baptism of the Holy Spirit. So Matthew 3, uh, 10 through 12. All right, Matthew 3, 10 through 12. So it says, sorry, let me get to the, and even now the ax is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water into repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the shaft with unquenchable fire. Now, it's very important. Um, it's very important that we talk about this. Uh, I'm going to go to Luke's account real quick, I'll show you all something interesting. So, in Luke, you go down. Um, all right, so it says, Then he said to the multitudes that came out to be baptized by, by him, Brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath to come, therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance. Do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So the people asked him, saying, what shall we do then? So notice that the context is that John is talking to the people, right? So it's a look at verse 15. Um, now, as the people were in expectation, all reason in their hearts about, about John, whether he was the Christ or not, John answered, saying to all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I is coming, whose sandal strap I'm not worthy to loose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fans in his hand, he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Now, this does not destroy the case um, that baptism in the Holy Spirit was for the apostles. And let me try to explain to you something. I think it's very important. Notice here, in this case, I indeed baptize you with water. Okay. So, in a, so we can see that John is limiting his audience even more. It's to those who have received John's baptism. But we can exclude it even more because that's where we go to Luke 24, and then we go to Acts 1, and we see that it is made to the apostles. But we can see it even here um, 
there's a hint of that. Because you can see here, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Now, logically, the fire, so the fire, some people say, well, that's the uh, tongues of fire in Acts 2, verse 3. No, the context is unquenchable fire. Now, some have said, well, maybe that's referring to the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. Okay, even if that is the case, uh, and um, sadly, we know that there were Jews who were rebellious against God who were destroyed in AD 70, but also they will be cast into hell. So, what is talking about AD 70 or, or hell? I tend to go with hell uh, with the context. Um, but you can see here that it definitely, both are not going to receive Holy Spirit and fire. So what, what's being said here? Okay. I think that's very important. And in order to show that, I want to kind of maybe produce something for you that kind of gives you an idea. Okay. And that is, there's going to be a baptism in the Holy Spirit for some, and baptism in fire for some. Okay, that's what's what's really going on here. That's what we need to recognize. Um, and so, at Jesus' ascension, Jesus told the apostles they would receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And notice that nothing's said about baptism in fire. So, to whom is the statement made? Well, Matthew 3, verse 7, the speaker to the wicked and penitent, and penitent Pharisees and Sadducees. So, the baptism of fire will be reserved to those who were rebellious against God, who would not repent, who would not receive John's baptism, who would not change. Um, even after John's baptism um, was in, made ineffective, you know, we see that the baptism of the Great Commission was brought forth, and many of them did not receive that either. So, they did not obey the gospel. So, definitely we see here uh, as a case that we need to think about to whom is the statement made. And we got to take the whole Bible, right? We got to go further. And then you find out who the promise was made to. And we see that the baptism of the Holy Spirit was made to the apostles, as Acts 1, 5 through 8 talks about. So, I hope that that uh, helps you all to understand this, because I think that's very important uh, when we're talking about these matters, uh, because there's a lot of uh, false teaching given about the baptism in the Holy Spirit, and we need to understand it very carefully, that it was a miraculous, overwhelming power that was given to the apostles. We know that because of... Uh, if you don't mind, let's just look at a scripture here. I think that's very important. Uh, look how Luke defines it. I mean, that's what we need to look at. So, um, look at Luke 24. Oh. So, you go down to... The, it says, then he said to them, thus is written, thus, thus is necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead a third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. Notice this, but tarry, wait in the city of Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on, from on high. And no doubt... That's equated to the baptism of the Holy Spirit because Luke also wrote the book of Acts. And so, you know, it's very important that we understand who is speaking and to whom they're speaking to. And I hope that this lesson has been good to you. I appreciate y'all staying just a little bit more for part eight. Uh, thank you so much.